This is one of the most beloved cases in the ITX community. It's called the T1 from the company formed. And after working in it for the past few days, it's pretty easy to see why. Every piece is perfectly machined with no panel gaps or inconsistencies and just has a completely solid build quality. It has this super clean, modern, minimalistic aesthetic that I absolutely love and has fantastic component compatibility with its adjustable center, which basically allows you to customize the middle section of the case to accommodate either a larger GPU with less CPU cooler clearance or vice versa based on your needs. But this case doesn't come assembled for you. There is some setup required and that's what we're gonna build today. Later on, we'll take a look at this video sponsor, Loop Deck. But for now, let's take a look at the parts and see what it's like to build a new system in the T1. Starting with the CPU, I'll be using my personal favorite at the moment, the AMD Ryzen 7 7800X 3D. It's one of the fastest gaming chips available with very impressive power consumption. It will perform exceptionally well in any modern game or application, especially ones that take advantage of the large 3D packaged V-cache. There are some other options you could consider. On the Intel side, there's the 13600, which will give you the option of using DDR4 or DDR5 RAM, which could save you some money. There's also the newer 14600. I haven't checked that out myself, but early reviews are saying that it's not quite worth the higher price tag. Some pricier CPUs like the 7950X 3D might be considered a more well-rounded chip when you factor performance in productivity tasks, but that comes with a much steeper price at $700, whereas this 7800X 3D retails for $450, but it's also been on sale recently for under $400. I suspect that there will be some good deals on the CPU during the Black Friday sales this month as well. As for the AM5 motherboard, we're gonna be using the B650EI from ASUS. This has also been a staple for most of my AM5 ITX builds, as it just has the right amount of features for what I typically look for in a gaming PC. You've got your fan headers for the CPU, AIO, and chassis across the top, this very understated black design for the VRM cooling array, two M.2 slots, the front one with a black backplate and heatsink, and then the other on the back. It also has a Type-C header, and then of course a PCI 5.0 slot for our graphics card. And then for connectivity, a ton of USB ports, 2.5G Ethernet, and built-in Wi-Fi 6E. So now we can just open up the CPU socket lid on the motherboard and carefully lower the CPU into the socket, with the gold triangle on the chip pointing at the top left, matching the triangle marked on the socket as well. Then we can just close the lid and then push the retention arm down under the hook. Because we are on the AM5 platform, we do need to use DDR5 memory. And so I have this kit from Corsair. This is a 32 gig set of DDR5 6000 memory from their Vengeance line. Because I do a lot of ITX builds on the channel, I tend to have a lot of these low clearance sticks. You could probably get away with a set that isn't this compact in this build, but it certainly doesn't hurt. They have a solid aluminum heat spreader to help remove the heat, they perform well, and I think they look quite good as well. These do happen to have an Expo profile so that we'll have that overclocking option available in the BIOS if you wanna get those full advertised speeds and proper timings. So let's open up the latches on the slots, align the notch, and then gently push down evenly until you hear both sides click into place. For storage, I'm just gonna be using a single two terabyte stick from Samsung. This one is the 980 Pro. It's a pretty popular mid-range drive and I found these to be very reliable and I use them pretty frequently in my builds. But you could also go with something like a Crucial P3 instead. I usually just pick up whatever's on sale from Crucial or Samsung personally. So I'm only putting in one stick today, but don't forget that you do have that second slot on the back if you do need it. Now that the motherboard prep is complete, we can get started assembling the case. So the T1 does not come assembled. It's shipped in a flat pack. And once you open the box and see all the different pieces, it can seem a bit overwhelming at first. But once you get everything out and organized, it's actually not too bad of a process. There are a handful of different colors to choose from. I chose the silver finish, and I think it looks super clean. It almost looks like it belongs in an Apple lineup. All the pieces are very neatly laid out, but I do wish they included an organized tray for the hardware, like many other case manufacturers have done. Some of these screws look very similar, like the flathead screws and the short countersunk screws. So I would recommend taking the time to organize them yourself before starting so that you don't accidentally use an incorrect screw during the build. So the first and one of the most important aspects is determining the slot size you're gonna use for the GPU clearance. If you grab the rear and front panels, you can see there's six mounting points. This is where the top strut will be installed. Depending on your GPU size, that will determine what slot spacing you'll wanna use for adequate space. So starting from the middle of the case, you'll have a three and a quarter slot spacing to one slot spacing at the outermost position. The card I'm using is actually 2.7 slot, but I'm gonna set it to the three slot position as I might be switching this out for a 4090 Founders Edition card later on. So we can secure this to each of the panels using the longer countersunk screws. Then let's grab one of the side struts, orient it with the indent towards the back of the case and secure it to the GPU side with two more long countersunk screws. Next up, we can grab the shift IO bracket and position it on the back panel with these two small tabs facing toward and up against those two struts we just installed. 
with a cutout towards the top of the case. Then we can secure that through the back panel with a short countersunk screw and to the top strut with a long one. Next up, let's grab the riser bar. With this side oriented up, we can attach one end to the IO bracket with a long screw and for the other side, we have these standoffs. Now, depending on your GPU slot position will determine which combination of standoffs are needed. For my GPU slot position, I'm gonna be using this combination of standoffs, which can then be secured to the side strut using a short countersunk screw. There are two different sizes of these smaller standoffs. A few of them are just slightly longer than the others. Those are supposed to be used for the motherboard, so try not to mix those up. Another reason I wish they supplied this hardware in an organized tray. Now we just need to attach the power supply bracket to the top strut on the motherboard side and secure that using three flathead screws, two through the top strut and one on the panel. We're almost ready to start putting components in, but first let's grab these four motherboard standoffs and screw them into these two positions on the top strut and the two positions on the riser bar. Then we can install the power button, which can be installed on either side of the case. I'm gonna install mine on the motherboard side by sliding this plastic button top through the side hole and then grabbing the actual button and aligning it with the two holes with the white button facing towards the plastic piece and then securing it with two screws. If you are using a two and a half inch drive, you can also secure that to the front panel using the holes towards the top of the case. We're ready to start filling the case with our components and for the power supply, I'll be using the Corsair SF750 80 Plus Platinum. This is easily my favorite power supply to use in ITX builds as it's very silent, efficient, and highly regarded for small form factor builds. And at 750 watts, this will easily meet the minimum requirements needed for this 7800 XT system. I'm measuring a full system power draw from the wall at around 370 watts when playing Cyberpunk 2077 at ultra settings in 1440p. It also includes these really nice braided cables in the box that are far and away easier to manage in small cases, but I'll actually be using some custom cables made for Corsair Type 4 power supplies that I ordered with another build I did a few months ago because they're just very flexible and easy to work with. The ones that come with the SF750 should work fine, but they may be difficult to route in such a tight case. It would be worth investing into some custom cables. If you can, you can check out some companies like Cable Mod or Mod DIY. So with the power supply fan oriented towards the outside of the case, let's secure it to the bracket with the four screws included with the power supply. Now I'm gonna place the riser cable over the strut and grab our motherboard, align it with the four standoffs and secure it into the case with four flathead screws. Then we can push one end of the riser cable into the PCI Express slot and then secure the other side to the riser bar with two flathead screws. I think this is a good point to start plugging in some of our power connectors before things start to get tighter. So that's the CPU and motherboard power connections, then the PCI Express power cables for the GPU. Then we can plug in the power switch to the front panel connectors. Next, let's run the power supply cable from the top of the power supply unit, across the bottom, over the riser bar, and then to the cutout at the bottom of the case and secure it. If you're planning to air cool and want to install a couple of standard fans at the top, then you'll wanna use these longer fan brackets. However, for this build, I'm gonna be using an AIO, and this is the Cooler Master Master Liquid 240 Atmos. This is a very impressive and quiet new CPU cooler. Opening up the box, and we have everything very nicely organized, so you can easily grab the proper socket and accessories. I do really appreciate that the fans come pre-installed. This is something that I wish more coolers did. However, because of the limited space and the specific needs of this build, I will be replacing them. Because there isn't much room between the motherboard and the radiator, we will need to use a slim fan at this position. So I've got a Noctua A12 by 15 Chromax black fan that I'll be using. And this is the same side that we need to use for our shorter AIO brackets for the case. You will actually need to pick up some shorter 632 radiator screws to attach it as well. You can order these separately, or if you go with an Arctic P12 Slim fan instead, they'll actually include those in the box. To match our Slim Noctua fan, I'll also be using this Chromax black fan in the other position. Now this fan will be directly over the power supply and cables, so I'm also going to add a fan grill here to prevent any of those wires from hitting the blades. With the radiator all set up, we can position the water block into the case and then secure the second side strut. I'm going to plug the radiator fans into the motherboard, and then we can attach the AIO by sliding the brackets over the recesses on the side struts. But before securing it, just make sure you didn't get any cables caught into the fans. Next, we can grab the AMD standoffs from the Atmos box and screw those into the existing backplate around the CPU socket. Then attach and secure the two mounting brackets for the water block, apply a bit of thermal paste to the CPU, plug the AIO pump cable into the pump header on this motherboard and lower the cooler onto the CPU. Whenever you're securing a CPU cooler, you always wanna make sure you tighten one to two rotations in an X pattern to apply even pressure. Now we just need to plug in the breakout box into the motherboard and SATA power. 
then run the second cable from the pump to the box as well. I was able to tuck this away behind the front cover on the GPU side. Now, I'm not gonna lie, this new water block looks pretty sick. I really love the stealth gray color and the design of the face. I think it matches the case and overall look really well. It's got a little bit of RGB, but I think it's done in a very tasteful way as it casts these deep shadows inside the patterns on the pump top cover. You can also take the clear part off and replace the top cover if you wanted with a different design. Cooler Master has some that you can 3D print, and then of course you could design your own if you're into that. And this setup is pretty silent as well. Under a full gaming load playing Cyberpunk 2077 at 1440p for two hours, I'm measuring around 47 decibels, all while the 7800X 3D is staying at a very reasonable 72 degrees Celsius. Same thing playing Alan Wake 2 at max settings 1440p. So I think Cooler Master's redesigned dual chamber pump in the Atmos is looking pretty successful here. But it's time to install the GPU and today I'm gonna be using the Gigabyte 7800 XT Gaming OC. This is the best value GPU at the $500 price point at the moment. It's pretty evenly matched with the Nvidia's 4070 while being $100 cheaper and with more VRAM, making it a pretty easy recommendation for this high range price point as long as you're okay without all of the Nvidia features like DLSS. Now AMD does have their competing tech with FSR, but as far as upscaling tech goes, FSR just doesn't look nearly as good as DLSS in my opinion. Still, this is a very capable GPU and it's best paired with a high refresh rate 1440p monitor like the one I have here from Gigabyte. Running Cyberpunk 2077 Phantom Liberty at ultra settings 1440p, I'm seeing around 70 frames per second without any upscaling tech and ray tracing off. Now I'm only in the opening sections of Alan Wake 2 at the moment, which is a pretty demanding game, but even here, using the high preset in 1440p, I'm consistently at that 60 frames per second target. This CPU and GPU combo would also make this a great PC for content creation and streaming. And so I've been using the Loop Deck Live that was sent over to me for the past month or so to help with some multitasking. It's an incredibly powerful and compact customizable console that can be used for multiple use cases. And it has a really clean design that I think matches pretty well with my setup. It's made for any workflows like streaming, video editing, maybe you need some shortcut setup in your IDEs if you're a software engineer, whatever it is, you can set it up to work for your needs. The version I have here has a ton of customizability options. There's 12 adaptable touch buttons that give haptic feedback to launch different applications, mute your mic, or whatever else you can think of. There's also six analog dials to adjust different volumes in real time, and eight more tactile buttons across the bottom that I like to use to switch touchscreen pages, but those are fully customizable as well. And so you can use all of these customizable buttons to control your game live streams in one place with the new Streamlabs plugin. This way you can quickly launch your stream and then use the loop deck to quickly change your scenes, mute your mic, and any other adjustments you need to make in real time. And customizing it is super simple as well. The software connects to your streaming setup and organizes all of your sources out of the box. From there, you simply drag and drop the actions into whichever button you want. With Loop Deck and Streamlabs now being part of the same Logitech family, you can expect more features like this being added to the Loop Deck in the future. If you wanna check it out, I'll have a link in the description below. Now the GPU compatibility in the T1 here is quite good up to an oversized 3.25 slot GPU, depending of course on your CPU cooler height and where you configure the spine, and up to 325 millimeters in length. A pretty popular option is to cram a 4080 or 4090 Founders Edition card. If you wanna do that, then I would recommend picking up a custom flexible 12 volt high power cable like the one I have here from Mod DIY. Okay, so let's grab the GPU bar and attach it with the two short flathead screws. Then we can lower the card into the case, align it with the PCI Express slot, and then gently push the card into the slot until the PCI Express slot locks. Then we can use another short flathead screw to secure the GPU bar to the case and then connect our two eight pin power cables. All that's left to do is slide on our two side panels, slide on the top panel, and that's the build complete. So you can fit a lot in this 9.9 liter case. And I mean, this is an incredibly dense package here. Now, despite forums touting it as an ultimate backpackable PC, this isn't really gonna fit comfortably into a standard size backpack. You'll wanna look for a bigger camera bag or something like that if you plan to travel with it. It is a more involved case setup process compared to something like the Fractal Terra, but considering just how well machined every piece of this case is and just the overall quality, I think it's well worth the extra effort, and in my opinion, another very satisfying build. But let me know what you think about it in the comments below. I hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for watching, and I will see you in the next one.